once again, hi everyone. My name is uh, Tendai Dara. I'm the campus director for the National Investment Society Technology in Zimbabwe. You, I hope you guys can hear me. Can everyone hear me? If you can hear me, just raise your thumb. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to welcome you to our fifth webinar with Ms. Kate Stroke. Um, so to, to start our, 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 our webinar, I'll just uh, lay out uh, a few ground rules. Make sure if you are not speaking, you unmute, you, you mute yourself rather, so that at least we avoid disruptions that can come from uh, background uh, noises. So for the first uh, 45 to 50 minutes, we have our, our, um, we'll start our webinar. For the first 15 minutes rather, we have our moderated uh, conversation or dialogue with Ms. Kate. And for the remaining 30 minutes or so, we're going to open up the platform to a question. So if you have any questions for Ms. Kate, make sure as we go with the, the conversation, you get to type your questions in the chat box. And don't forget that when you are typing your question, introduce yourself, tell us where you're coming from, your university and your country, and uh, get to ask your question. So to begin the talk, allow me to introduce Ms. Kate, um, who is uh, our key speaker for today. So Ms. Kate uh, is the lead project for Gates Foundation's largest campaign called The Goalkeepers. In this capacity, she is responsible for stakeholder engagement, managing timelines, deliverables, and due dates across the campaign. And these deliverables also involve uh, the likes of reports, events, campaigns, and accelerators. In addition, she manages uh, stakeholder engagement and management for the campaign leadership team. Kate joined um, the global policy and advocacy in December 2012. Uh, prior to that, she spent four years um, on WSH team as a senior program assistant while completing an undergraduate degree. Uh, Kate was an MA in policy uh, studies from University of Washington, where she focused on state uh, government alternative sanitation policy, as well as bachelor's degree in business administration, focusing on corporate communication, Prior to joining the Gates Foundation, Kate was the staff associate at the National League of Cities, where she coordinated uh, the board's oversight and engagement. Also, she ma also managed a large municipal government uh, convenings. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome Ms. Kate. Ms. Kate, I see she's already on the webinar. It's a pleasure having you. Hi, thank you for that intro, Tendai. Um, much appreciated. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Uh, today, I'd love to talk a little bit about goalkeepers, um, tell you guys about what we're doing here at the foundation, uh, answer any questions you might have, uh, and and hopefully, you know, explain a little bit about um, uh, all that we do. Uh, before I get started, I want to um, thank uh, MCN and the United Nations Academic uh, Impact for launching the Millennium Fellowship. Thank you guys so much. Um, I also want to um, thank you guys for all your commitment to the goals and, and for all that you guys are doing. Um, your collaborations is, is, is so inspiring and, and signals that people care about the goals and that it's important and that we want to make the world a better place. And it's, it's so cool to see that so many of you are out there um, making it the world uh, a better place so that um, everyone gets to, um, so that we achieve uh, a vision that all lives have equal value. So um, thank you so much for that. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I uh, let me know if should I turn it back over to you or or how would you like to do this? Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful remarks, Miss Kate. Also, uh, to just get into to our fifteen minute uh, dialogue, uh, I would want to start by asking a question. I see you have been working with the goalkeepers for seven years now, uh, and so can you tell us a little bit more about the projects and initiatives uh, that uh, the goalkeepers work on and how you measure the impact of this project? especially towards attaining the SDGs. Yeah, yeah, I would love to talk about goalkeepers. So um, goalkeepers is, um, at its, its most basic, the most kind of basic pieces of goalkeepers are a few things. Um, we, the Gates Foundation creates a report um, that kind of sheds light on the SDGs that it cares about 
most around global health and development uh, each year. Along those lines, we also um, we have a, a kind of a um, a bit of a global stage moment each year at the United Nations General Assembly uh, in September in New York to talk about um, progress on those goals and try to inspire people um, on those goals and raise awareness. And then around that, we have a social media campaign where we try to reach um, we try to reach uh, as many people who are passionate about this work as possible, uh, both through earned media and social media. And then um, broadening a little further out, uh, just to show that you know it's not just things on paper and on stage, but we really truly care about this um, beyond the grants that the foundation makes. Uh, we work on something called accelerators, and these are multi-sectoral partnerships, and um, uh, to try and advance uh, the SDGs. And so it's finding um, unlikely uh, sets of organizations and groups who come together to advance the work. Uh, we, we did some, um, uh, there have been some great uh, work around uh, a, youth a youth accelerator where we were able to give out small amounts of money to individuals and organizations working on uh, data for the accelerators. That was really exciting, something we did in 2018 as an example. And then in addition, um, the kind of the final piece of the puzzle is, is something called uh, what we're kind of calling the community, if you will. Uh, we, have, um, we have the event, we have the report, we have the campaign and the accelerators, but we need a unique, we need individuals and, and people who are passionate about this work, who want to take it forward, who are the champions of the future. And so we're figuring out um, how we cultivate a community that accelerates collaboration, that um, finds ways to take new actions across um, the sectors uh, and make progress on the SDGs. Um, so those are the buckets of work. Uh, to kind of explain it in a in a quick nutshell, and all, what all of this ladders up to is that we want to accelerate progress towards the SDGs. Um, we have a slight preference for global health and development. Doesn't mean that all goals are very important. They are. It's just that's what the foundation knows. <laughs> it is global health and development. Um, uh, it, and then within that, we want to drive accountability so that leaders meet their SDG and financing policy commitments. And how we think we can best contribute to that is by uh, doing two things, uh, raising awareness of uh, SDG progress, by, uh, of progress that has happened to date and how it's being achieved. A lot of people don't know how well the Millennium Development Goals worked from 20, uh, 2000 to 2015. Um, so we'd like to tell that story and say that progress is happening, the world is getting better. Um, within that, um, but you know, that's just because we've also along those lines, just because we've made progress, it, it's not inevitable that we will continue to make that progress. We have to keep working. So it's that full narrative of, yes, there's progress, but it's not guaranteed for the future. And so how are we going to keep the needle moving? How are we going to keep that progress happening? We've got some big challenges and how are we going to get past all that? The other piece of the puzzle is how do we, ins um, how do we inspire people um, to accelerate progress? How do, we, how do we motivate them? How do we, uh, everyone has such great ideas. How do we um, help them find their own voice and, and, jump into what they feel passionate about. So those are um, the, the, those are our um, kind of, that's how we think about our strategy as a whole. And so we, going back to the five kind of components that I was talking about, we like, we want to create moments that support, encourage global leaders to take action towards the SDGs. Um, so that event that I was referring to, in New York in September, the campaign. And we also want to cultivate, like I, uh, as I mentioned before, a community that accelerates collaboration and has um, takes new actions across sectors um, against the SDGs as a whole. So that was a lot <laughs> that I just covered just now. Um, uh, I, I, 
it, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, we started in 2017, um, and so we've uh, just had our third uh, third report come out and had our third event at ANGA and getting ramped up uh, for next year into 2020 and hope to be doing this until 2030 when we see what kind of progress we've made on the SDGs. I'll pause there, Tentai. Okay, thank, thank you very much for, for the wonderful response. Uh, so from, from what you've just said, I was also going through your goalkeepers report for 2019 from multiple sectors to advance SDGs. So I'd want to know, um, you know, somehow we know either SDGs are interlinked somehow, although you talked about the issue of reality as your, your focal point. So I'd want to know that uh, how does goalkeepers maximize impact in partnerships for SDGs? Because I remember you also mentioned that you maximize in partnerships and from part of your, from the summit that you had, I, I saw you were bringing uh, so many great speakers like the prime minister from different countries, young people, the community. So how do you maximize on partnerships so that you ensure that you make more impact in terms of achievement of SDGs? Yeah, um, so there's a couple of ways that we try to do that. Um, as I mentioned, um, we before we ever take the stage, uh, we try to um, accelerate uh, we try uh, we try to bring together folks around something we call accelerators and this is bringing together partners from different sectors who are dedicated to pooling their collective investment brain power and big ideas to tackle one or more uh, SDGs and so uh, we've done that uh, in a few places uh, advancing digital financial inclusion for all in 2017 we did some work on the power of nutrition in 2017 um, they, uh, and, and um, in 2018, we also, as I mentioned, the Youth Accelerator. In 2019, we did something that's not in the foundation space that we were really excited about, is um, launching a Global Mental Health for All in 2019. Um, what this is, just to explain it, is partners commit to launching something entirely new that will be transformative in their impact on the SDGs. Uh, it'll bring in new donors or scaling in a new country or launching a new product. Um, and um, Goalkeepers is the mechanism to bring all those um, uh, groups of individuals together. So that's one way we try to uh, tackle this and show impact. In terms of um, folks on stage and the event as um, I think uh, you mentioned some of the heads of state that we've had on, on stage before. We've had former President Barack Obama on stage, uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, we have had, um, um, we have had uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. We've had uh, President Macron. And um, this year we had Prime Minister Sanchez and Arter, just to name a few. When we have those folks on stage uh, and as part of the moment, as we're looking to connect with them, we are, um, we are working behind the scenes to figure out what it is that they are interested, what do they want to promote. I, I'm not sure if, every, if um, folks on this call were able to see the live stream of goalkeepers, but this year, um, uh, Prime Minister Sanchez launched a $100 million commitment uh, to the Global Fund, which was really exciting and um, a big moment because that was uh, a moment for Spain to enter back into the donor mark, uh, into the donor space, which is something they had been out of more recently. Um, we are looking for ways to increase those um, connections and commitments and uh, find more ways to um, build those partnerships around these moments and what have you, but those are just a few examples of the things that we think about. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, for the response. Uh, so from what you just said, I'm, I'm getting to discover that you, you, you are you're actually going uh, a long way in trying to make sure you incorporate uh, young people from different uh, walks of life, you're incorporating the community, you're incorporating government officials, and this is really important when it comes to the attainment of SDGs. I remember SDG17 talks about partnership for the goals, and I'm sure all 
I would say goalkeepers in some way, yeah, they are also working passionately in trying to make sure uh, we attain the sustainable development goals. So just a reminder to the fellows, we are almost coming to the end of our 15 minutes of dialogue. So make sure you type your question in the chat box. And before you ask your question, uh, introduce yourself by typing your name, your university, and your country. Millennium fellows, uh, like uh, as I referred earlier, there are some our goalkeepers, and most of them have been in question. And they'd like to know how you've made it. So Millennium fellows, all of them that you are seeing are at the beginning of their social impact careers. And so what concrete advice would you give uh, all of the fellows that we have on the call and other fellows who will be, be able to listen to this uh, webinar maybe after the webinar is, uh, is, is now offline? So what advice would you give them uh, who are so, so that they at least start their social impact careers smoothly? I know you've been through a lot. I was going through your profile and I get to realize that you have worked with so many organizations. So what advice would you give them so that at least when they're starting their social impact careers, they get to understand how well they can make impact? Um, uh, the first thing I would say, and, and I know, I'm sure you guys have all heard this before, so uh, apologies if it's repetitive, but find where you're passionate, find where you're excited. Um, uh, you will, that inspiration in, in, in doing this work is, means so much. It will, it will keep you going when it's tough. It will, it will, it will inspire others, but yeah, figure out what it's, what is the space that you're excited about and you're passionate about and just go start from there. In terms of, um, in terms of getting started as you're leaving college and, and, and figuring out what you want to do, um, I, at least myself, I tried to, um, I tried to move into spaces that I was excited about, and that started with uh, municipal government. And, and so um, I, I followed my passion and, and took a, a small job working at the National League of Cities as um, uh, right out of the gate um, and, and trying to help with small cities and towns and learn from all, all around me, as many people as I, as I possibly could. Um, and, and that led to, um, other expanded opportunities and 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 let my let me feed my curiosity so um that would be my advice be willing to work really hard and and follow your passion it will i think it'll all work out for you guys okay thank you very much so you mentioned a very important point about following your passion and i'm sure um, all these fellows who are here they're actually trying to discover what their passion is so most of them are they're actually uh, they're actually curious to know how they can join uh, the goalkeepers. Is it an open call for everyone, or they need to go through a certain process? Ah, how to join goalkeepers? That's a great question. Um, so right now, um, the goalkeepers event is a number of as a nomination process in order to uh, be invited you need to be you need to have shown that you are um, already advancing um, progress on the SDGs um, and uh, to kind of get started to be invited to the moment and and to the platform um, to I would say if if you're just getting started and you're finding out about things um, I would check out um, our website to get going um, and, and see if there's any intersections and see what you're interested about, see what you're already working on. And maybe that's, um, maybe that's a, a campaign, um, Amika George, um, who did Period of Poverty, who I believe was only 16 when she came to Goalkeepers, um, but was is super uh, committed and passionate to that work was was able to change um, policy in the UK um, around that um, so uh, yeah so that would be my guidance and yeah <laughs> okay thank you very much see you on the same point uh, I'm sure I just want to clarify it for uh, on behalf of uh, for the benefit of all the other fellows who might want to ask I see goalkeepers uh, is part of is a campaign that is being run by the Gates Foundation, and the Gates Foundation is a very large uh, organization. So I'd want I'd want to know uh, if there is any opportunity for incentives. 
I, yeah. yeah. Um, so each spring, um, early spring, the foundation uh, works with a number of different universities and whatnot for internships. Um, I believe we have some, I'm, I'm not the one who can speak best to that, um, but we do work with um, um, a number of groups to uh, bring folks here on campus for the summer. It's quite actually exciting and inspiring. Um, to work with undergraduates, um, people in graduate school. Um, uh, we, on my team, which is external communications, uh, we had the opportunity two years ago to work with an individual um, who was going into his undergraduate work straight out of high school. And I, we actually found him incredibly inspiring and motivating because of his excitement for the work. And and just realizing that we'd all been in our own silos a little bit and not thinking um, thinking more expanded. Um, so uh, I can send up some follow-up information if useful uh, and share that around. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kate, for the uh, interesting uh, conversation. So I see a lot of fellows have been in questions. So I'd like to give them the opportunity to get to ask the questions that they have. So uh, what's going to happen? If I, I call out your name, you're going to be unmuted. So go straight into introducing yourself by typing your, by telling us your name, your university and your country, then ask your question. So I see there's a question from Emily. So Emily, you'll be unmuted and then introduce yourself. Uh, tell us who you are, your university, your country, and then ask your question. I'm Emily Guile. I'm from Washburn University in Kansas in the United States. And my question is, do you think it's a bad sign if you keep having to change your goals for a project? Um, so with goalkeepers, um, I have two minds about that. Um, on the one hand, with goalkeepers, we have not changed our primary goals since we started. We want to accelerate progress on the SDGs. That is absolutely paramount. And the thing that we are most passionate about here at the foundation, although we need, know we need to make room for all SDGs, is global health and development. Um, so on the one hand, I think that is is absolutely really important to um, be committed to what you truly, truly care about. On the other hand, uh, as you move along in a project, sometimes you learn things along the way that you just didn't know. And so as long as the, I think as long as the first premise holds true, your primary goal and you're learning along the way, it's okay to shift and change as long as you can show that learning um, and justify why you've had to adjust and um, shift your goals. I'll, for goalkeepers, when we started out, it was just a report, an event, and a campaign. It was a single moment uh, in 2017. And we learned in order to make progress on the SDGs, we can't have just a single moment. It has to be a year-round conversation. And um, that was probably a little bit of limited thinking on our part. So while our first premise remains true that we want to accelerate progress on the SDGs um, to make the world a better place, in order to do that, we had to shift our thinking a little bit and, and broaden that out to start a conversation, a longer conversation than just one moment in time. Thank you, Emily. That's a great question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emily, for, for the question. So the take home is uh, like what uh, Katie mentioned, uh, that is fellows, sometimes you get to realize that you, you start with uh, sustainable development goal one, and then along the way you realize that there is need for you to shift and to work on something related to education. So it's part of the learning curve. So I want to, uh, to ask Ms. Uh, Ms. Kate, uh, Katie, so uh, along the way when you were starting your, your, your social impact career, did you have such moments where uh, you had to change uh, the initial? I, I heard you mention something uh, about changing your primary goals at the Gates Foundation, but uh, I'd, I'd want you to advise us as fellows uh, on which steps, how, how did you realize that this is not the actual goal, the basic, uh, the primary, goal, primary goals that 
we are meant to, to we, we had set initially a scales foundation. How did you realize? Because it's difficult for you to know whether this is just out of my own personal choice. Is this my passion? How, how exactly did you realize that this is not Oh no, <laughs> I just lost you. Um, okay, um, I think that you were asking about a uh, combination. Miss Katie, oh, wow. can you hear me? Yes. yes, now I can hear you. Okay, so can... okay. okay. Uh, so um, is my, am I audible now? You're audible now. That's great. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I had a bit of an uh, instability in terms of connection. Uh, so I'll go straight. There's a question that I'm seeing from Barad. So Barad, you'll be unmuted. And please introduce yourself. Tell us your name. Tell us your university and uh, your country. Then ask your question. Hello. Yes, we can Hi, hear Barad. you, Barad. Yeah. Nice to meet you all. This is Barad from India. I'm a campus director of KS Rangasami College of Technology. Uh, my question is that uh, we are working on developing the quality education uh, sector of the SGD. The main thing is that in our country, the most people are not aware of the sustainable development goals of UN and uh, creating awareness among our peers or to the students of the community is really very tough because they have they don't have any normal idea of SGD. Do you have any kind of a technique or a process that you are gone into to educate the people? about the sustainable development goals? So that's a great question for us. Um, I think in, <clears throat> our experience is that it's country specific, community specific on what resonates. Um, uh, in, sometimes it helps to talk about maybe not the SDGs, but talk about the issues and starting with um, starting with topics around uh, world progress. Um, we at the foundation um, for a long time led with uh, stories to first kind of win hearts and minds about progress that needed to be made on the, across the globe. And then we would talk about um, data. How does that translate into numbers? Uh, as humans, we relate much more to an individual um, than we do to um, a, a set of, of data. So if you start with the individual story, then move into um, data about what that looks like in a bigger context, and then we come in with um, a moment where you say, look, all right, you've heard the story, you've heard the data, and we've got a plan. Um, sometimes that's easier rather than saying, you, saying talking about the SDGs as a whole. So that way, um, I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's not perfect, but that's, that's one way that we um, have been thinking about it is, is trying to relate human to human, and then bringing the data on, and then talking about the SDGs as a plan rather than um, talking about um, the SDGs as a leading moment. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. And then other question is that if the global keepers have any kind of an ambassadorship program or kind of some training program that's similar to the Millennium Fellowship, then it would be a great uh, platform for us to uh, learn a lot of things about the uh, SDGs and kind of things ha that are happening in the globe. So if you give some kind of insights or if you take some initiative, that will be more helpful to the person like us. So that is, we have heard that loud and clear that um, people want more training. They want an ambassadorship program. We are, um, is, um, <laughs> we're looking into that right now. We are seeing what is possible. Um, uh, we are trying to figure out how we can best um, build out and serve out this community and and trying to, are trying our best to um, be able to get there but we are still learning about how to best do that and and how to come forward so um, yeah all I can the best thing I can say at, at this point in time is 
is thank you for that feedback and you are not the only one, which makes me very excited and happy to hear that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much for, yeah, for, the, for the response. So I'm going to move on to the next question. I see there's a question from David. So David, you will be unmuted. Please introduce yourself. Tell us your university, your country, as well as uh, your name, then get to ask your, your question. Hello, David. Okay, it seems like we have a, a connectivity problem with David. So thank you very much, David, for the question. So uh, KT, David was asking that um, his question, he's saying, my question is, how do you deal with members of a project team who are being less efficient in executing their roles, given that they are student volunteers who are just not being paid? That is a hard one, David. Uh, that is a really hard one. Um, so um, in my line of work as a project manager, um, I get the, I think I get the best out of people when I make them responsible for a specific task within the broader work. Um, that is really hard when it's student volunteers who are not being paid. Um, it, what might be helpful is um, if one, you can task them with a specific piece of the project, but if it's maybe if it's possible to task them with a specific piece of the project that they're excited about and passionate about. Um, that is not always the case. Sometimes you got to do the boring stuff just to get it done. But if that is possible, um, that might result in a better outcome um, because they they at least feel that they're getting something out of it. They're getting to do something that they're excited about and committed to. So that's what I would try and do. Um, give them some specific responsibility uh, and and try to make it something that they're excited about. Tough okay, one. Thank you very much. I can, I can see. So thank you very much, Katie. So uh, I think what Katie is trying to say, Katie is trying to say is that uh, it all goes back to your initial point where you talked about passion. When you have a passion for something, then you have to make sure that you also uh, bring on board people who are also passionate about what you are doing. Because it's, it's going to be impossible bringing someone on board who is passionate about education when you're working on something related to health. So it's all about passion and building a team that is also passionate about the goal that you, you are trying to achieve. So uh, I'll move on to the next question. I see there is John. John has a question. So John, you'll be unmuted. Please introduce yourself. Uh, tell us your name, your university, and your country, then ask your question. Question. Hello, hi, can you hear me? All right. Um, OK, thank you. It's dark here, so don't mind that. I'm Fatou John, Lem um, Campus Fellow of the um, University of Illori. So my question, Katie, is how do we localize SDGs in the rural communities here? So it's somewhat difficult, uh, especially in the rural communities here in Nigeria, to reach them with the SDGs uh, because they can't really relate directly with it. So my question is, how do we, how do we localize SDGs in our rural communities? Thank you. Mm -hmm. That is a great, great question. Um, uh, it, I think that gets back my suggestion and 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 John I, I think I would I would first say I would trust some of your instincts um, uh, and and what you think might work was is probably going to be best my suggestion would be to think about um, what in those rural communities those folks care about and relate the SDGs through that story through that window um, Maybe it's about taking care of their kids. Um, I, that, um, I've got to. Uh, that would I'd be very passionate about that. And and how um, how can the SDGs help take care of their kids? Take it through that lens and that window. Um, uh, and then, uh, which gets back to my previous point about starting with the individuals, uh, starting about the stories of individuals, then um, talking about the data, and then talking about the plan that is the SDGs. Um, 
would be one way that might uh, resonate in a, in a smaller local community. Okay, thank you very much for, for the wonderful uh, response. So uh, what I just learned from what you said is that uh, it's, it's always good to think global since we are, we are working on sustainable development goals and the vision 2030. But it's also important to get to understand what your community is in need of and getting to align your SDGs to what they are currently what they are currently are interested in. So I'll move on to the next question from Joshua. So Joshua, you will be unmuted. Please introduce your, yourself. Tell us your name, your university, and also get to ask your question. Oh, it seems like we have a connectivity problem. I, I can't hear Joshua. So thank you very much for the great question, Joshua. So Joshua is saying that uh, my question is, how does one get to fund bright visions that are not yet materializing due to, um, I think he's trying to say, the lack of funds rather, yeah. Project. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Which is a great question. Uh, Joshua, um, it it really depends on um, what the project is and and who the possible donors are um, that align with what you are what you are trying to do. Um, there, <laughs> if uh, it would be great if there were some sort of um, if somebody could coordinate a, a way to find the money out there with the possible projects um, that has not been invented yet so if somebody can come up with that I bet that'd be a great idea um, but uh, I would figure out um, once you know what your project is about figure out what donors are out there who are passionate about that particular topic or issue um, uh, most donating uh, donating organizations will list on their websites and what have you what are the areas they fund what are they uh, excited about and and figure it out uh, work from that point um, is is check through those the possible lists of donors uh, that you can think of and then figure out who is funding in your specific space um, it's it's amazing um, how unique the spaces that uh, different donors are funding in um, so uh, I would start there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you are the founder of the Gates Foundation, Bill Gates himself. So he was saying that uh, the greatest um, funding that you can give to your project is your time, your skill, and yeah, yeah, those basic two are the ones that I remember. So always remember that. Are your time and your skills are the starting point when it comes to implementing the project. So if it's SDG awareness, then giving your time is the very most important thing, and that's the starting point. So always remember that. So I'm going to move on to the question from um, is uh, I hope I pronounced it well. Can you hear me? So we are going to be unmuted and then get to ask you a question. Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi. Yeah. My my question is, uh, in in the sustainability of your project, yes. Just the, if you have a time mm -hmm. frame, in the sustainability of your project into the future, how do you use indicators to gauge the success of your project? If, for instance, like the project I was working on on eradicating poverty and uh, enhancing quality education. In a particular community. So, how, how high is the sustainability of my project going to be into the future? And as using it, as using the indicator, okay, I would say 50% has been reached. So, how do, how do I use the indicators to gauge the success of my project? Got a question? Mm -hmm. That is a great question. So, in terms of thinking about um, indicators for goalkeepers, um, we, uh, we think about uh, certain metrics we want to achieve that ladder up to our higher level goals. So um, with that, um, we have uh, a few things that we are thinking about um, for 
I hope everybody can still hear me. Um, we want to think about um, how many uh, how many new accelerators that we can launch. Um, how can we get, we're trying right now to think about how we can get uh, funding to individuals to try and make progress on the SDGs. Um, we are thinking about um, indicators around our campaign um, and, and trying to think about um, basic things like um, number of people that we can reach. Uh, for example, on our uh, global uh, social media campaign, we've reached 21, mil we reached 21 million people in 2019. Um, in terms of uh, traditional media during Ungo Week, we were ended up being number two um, across, um, across the multiple um, uh, events that week. And uh, we calculated that we reached about 166 million people. Uh, during that particular week. So with, with each of the components of the five components that are referred to, we think about a series of um, kind of key, what we call them key performance indicators uh, year over year. And then we figure out what are the outcomes that we want that to ladder up to in the next three years and then in the next five years and with the hopes that we achieve our grand vision um, by 2030. It's, I find it to be a little bit more um, difficult as we're talking about um, reports and events and campaigns and community connections um, as opposed to uh, uh, easier things to count like vaccinations or um, um, access to vitamins or what have you but uh, we're, we're trying to um, we're getting better and better about um, counting those uh, metrics and indicators uh, as you alluded to um, very important thing to do very important and we're yeah we're, we're tracking away okay thank you very much for for the question so just to to, to motivate you on uh, what uh, Katie has just said, I, I'll continuously refer to Bill Gates because I'm sure he's an inspiration to so many fellows who are on this webinar. So I remember he, he also said that uh, sustainable development is a, is a result of the mindset. It's not something that you, you achieve out of nowhere. Once you manage to educate people on, uh, once you manage to, to actually plan a mentality of sustainable development, then you'd have made it. So always remember that if you are like myself, I'm working on SDG4. So always remember that if you're working on a project that is somehow advancing education, then you are doing a great thing because it begins with education. Then yeah, people get to understand where they are going. So sustainable development is a result of the mindset. I quote, it's not my quote, please. I'm not stealing it from Bill Gates. So thank you very much for, for the great question. So my question is, um, I'm, like what I mentioned, I'm from Africa, I'm from Zimbabwe. So I'd like to ask if uh, the Gates Foundation is actually reached, uh, which areas are you covering at the moment? Yeah, rather that's the question. Uh, which, uh, your question is which, um, which countries are, and areas are we covering uh, through the Gates Foundation on the continent of Africa? Yeah, yes, um, <laughs> yes. We, um, <laughs> we have um, projects um, across the continent um, and I'll be honest I can't tell you every single country that we're in but there are a lot what I can tell you um, is that we have um, we have a we have something that we call uh, for lack of a better term um, focus areas areas where we're trying to coordinate all of our grants in our work in a few particular countries in the continent of Africa. One of those countries is Nigeria. Um, we have a country office there. Uh, there we're working hard to coordinate all of our funding and efforts and work with the Ni Nigerian government and partners on the ground. Another place that we're doing that, uh, other places that we're doing that is uh, Kenya and Ethiopia. Um, uh, so, um, 
it's a, <laughs> those are just a few countries. Um, I, there are lots of other projects across the continent and uh, what have you. Um, but there is a particular focus um, from the foundation um, in those particular geographies uh, where we are uh, working really, really hard to coordinate um, grants. Okay, well, thank you very much. So I'll just add, maybe the fellows who just joined us, uh, my name is Tendai Dara. So uh, Miss Miss Katie is talking about uh, was talking about passion, and this is really key use. I'll say yeah that you need for you to be able to make sure you make impact. So she was talking about you're talking about. Um, can you can you still hear me? Yes, I can still hear you. Okay, thank you. I was afraid that my I'm 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 getting you know because my network was was not in uh, stable rather. So uh, she was talking about passion, which is something that is really key in making sure you make impact, doing something that you like. Even if you're doing it for free, you'll see that it won't even strain you because it's something that you're interested in. So I'll move on to the next question from Andrew. So Andrew, you'll be unmuted. Please introduce yourself. Uh, tell us your, your university and your country, then get to ask your question. So, in reading Andrew's question, it looks like um, he can't ask his question over audio. Um, so I will take it from here. Um, how does goalkeepers work uh, coordinate with local organizations that are the hallmark of a six and what are the hallmarks of a successful relationship? Um, so a goalkeepers does uh, a couple of ways to coordinate with local organizations. Um, one is the uh, multi-sectoral partnership, the accelerators. Um, that is one way uh, that we partner with local organizations. Um, in the case of uh, the Ending Child Marriage Fund, um, that, is, um, that was a partnership in 2018 where um, we found donors to work with multiple local organizations on the ground to end child marriage and change um, that behavior. Um, then uh, the other way that we're exploring, um, we're, this is new, we're exploring, I, <laughs> uh, but we're, we're trying to see if um, our, uh, our, um, our uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Our Goalkeepers Advisory Board. We have um, 10 individuals um, across eight countries uh, that we are um, partnering with to get advice, to um, figure out what um, local coordination might look like. In addition, working with um, our regional uh, colleagues from the foundation on the ground. Um, we have not cracked in that on this. We're, we're figuring it out as we go, uh, but I'm hopeful for 2020 um, that there might be um, there might be a way to uh, better connect beyond uh, just the accelerators opportunity uh, with local organizations because it, it, what I'm hearing as just one individual uh, is that people are excited. They want to continue the work, but they need um, need they need help coordinating. They need help um, getting funding, and, and we need to find ways to do that uh, with local organizations. So, uh, all of that to say, I think there will be more to come from us on that in 2020. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Katie, for, for the response. So um, most of the fellows are graduating sometime this month. They are, they are, they will be alumni of uh, the Millennium Fellowship. So what, what advice, yeah, what advice, thank you very much. What advice would you give them? Because I'm sure most of them would want to continue working on their project even after the fellowship. So how can they keep themselves motivated? Because I'm sure these webinars and, you know, all the reports that we're supposed to submit to MCN, was some kind of motivation. But after the fellowship, how can they continuously motivate themselves so that they continuously work on SDGs? Well, um, for, for those who are lucky enough, um, if you can find a role or a position uh, continuing to work on what you're passionate about, that would be 
ideal because then you can put your passion into your work and really uh, keep the needle moving on the SDGs um, coming out of undergrad or graduate school or school in general, what have you. Um, if, if you're not one of the lucky ones, um, and uh, then it's, it's figuring out maybe you can serve on um, serve in a serve in a volunteer capacity um, in your spare time in your uh, in your local community. Um, there was a time where um, there was a time where I worked for a, I wasn't able to work in the um, public sector uh, in working on the SDGs and, and working on to make the world a better place. I just didn't have that opportunity and I was working uh, in the for-profit world. Um, not my passion, not my excitement, um, but during that time uh, to kind of keep me going and keep me excited in my spare time, I did a little bit of volunteering and that did two things for me. Um, it kept me inspired, it kept me excited about the work and it kept me uh, connected uh, to the work in, in some way. Um, it wasn't a lot of volunteer time, um, but um, it, it was some, and it was, it, was, it, it was a chance to give back to the community, a chance to stay connected, and a chance to stay motivated. Um, and I think that could come in many forms. Maybe it's in board service. Maybe it's um, volunteering in um, uh, food uh, food programs. Maybe it's um, all kinds of ways um, that you could do that. But um, if you're not one of the lucky ones straight out of school who's able to get a role in um, the sector that you want, um, some 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 small form of volunteering, at least for me, was a great motivator to eventually bring me back into the sector that I wanted to be in and be a part of and reminded me why the stuff is so important and so exciting. Okay, thank you very much, Katie. So I'm going to take um, another question from Mohammed. So Mohammed, you're going to be unmuted. Please uh, introduce yourself, tell us your university, your country, and then ask your question. Hello, Mohammed. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. You hear me? You hear yes, me? we can hear you. Yes. Can you ask? Introduce yourself and ask the question. I'm Mohammed Al Ahmadi from uh, Yemen, Arazi University. Um, my question is uh, about uh, marginaliz uh, marginalization in Yemen. Uh, we gathered uh, the helping for them. But uh, they uh, try to buy this uh, helping. How can we solve this uh, problem? Um, do, you, do you understand me? Yes, I understand you. I, I can read your you. question, Mohammed. Um, that is a great question. And Mohammed, I wish I had a, a good answer for you. Um, unfortunately, I don't. I, I don't know the context. Um, I. You know, I, it's tough when you think about people who are being who are marginalized. They're they're doing what they can just just to survive. Um, uh, I yeah, um, I think I would need to know more about the project itself in order to be able to give good guidance. And and quite frankly, I think you're probably in a better position to um, think about the best solution because you have the context on the ground um, and, and might know what, um, might know how best to solve it and what the motivations are. Um, beyond figuring out, um, beyond figuring out what those motivations are, I couldn't give you, I just don't know the answer, but I would start with figuring out what those, what, um, why they're selling the aid and, and, then maybe you can get to a, a correction to solve the problem. Okay, thank you very much, Mohammed, for, for the great question. Uh, so uh, just to wrap up, um, 
Katie, thank you very much for taking your time uh, to share your experiences and, you know, uh, about the, the goalkeepers and everything. So I'm sure there are a lot of fellows like Muhammad would like to, you know, keep in touch with you and get to uh, receive guidance and clarity on certain things. How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, um, I'll uh, type my email in here. Happy to talk with people who are interested in the work and excited about the goals. Um, um, yeah, um, I'm happy to connect and, and tell you guys all that I know. I do want to say that just talking with all of you and hearing from all of you and, and, and hearing about everyone's excitement and passion about the work, you guys are amazing. You guys are just amazing. The world is going to be a better place. So it's, it's really neat to see all that you're doing. Very inspired. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you again, Kate, for, for the amazing talk. It was really fruitful, and I'm sure the fellows have learned a lot uh, from what you just said. And just to reinforce before I conclude, remember, follow your passion, do what you like, and also make sure you have a team of uh, young people, rather, or people who are also passionate about what you are doing. So um, thank you to all the fellows who joined uh, our webinar today. I hope you are able to gain uh, some great uh, insights from Katie. And also, we look forward to seeing you to our next webinar with Christine uh, on Friday, that's on the 18th, 8th of November this week, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So you can register for the webinar on CREW, or you can also register via the Millennium Fellowship website. So once again, Kate, thank you very much for taking your time. Thank you for the information and knowledge. I know you are a very busy person, but thank you for the sacrifice and everything. And to all the fellows, Let's continue engaging uh, through the webinars and let's continue getting in touch with our speakers. So get in touch with Katie if you need anything. So uh, to the team, MCN, thank you very much for organizing the, the webinar for us. It was really fruitful and helpful. So uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, see you in the next webinar. Okay. Bye. Thank you.